Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 125, Space Shuttle Flight 53, STS-54, Facing Infinity. Last time, we talked about the 13th flight of Space Shuttle Columbia, STS-52. The flight carried the last classified Department of Defense payload of the shuttle program, tested out a snazzy camera, and taught us not to trust clouds to do as they're told. We also scratched our heads, wondering what in the world Mission Commander Dave Walker was thinking with some of his quote-unquote dog names. But it turns out there was some logic to it after all. Thanks to listener Stu for writing in to explain the connection between Jim Voss being a member of the United States Army and Commander Walker dubbing him Dogface. It turns out that Dogface has been a nickname for Army infantrymen for decades, starting out as an insult, but an insult which they soon embraced. Never question dog name logic, and never try to insult an army infantryman, I guess. And actually, speaking of Stu, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to his dad and fellow listener, Bruce, who's been having a rough time. Hang in there, Bruce. If doing this podcast has taught me anything, it's that as long as you keep moving forward, even if it doesn't feel like much at the time, you'll accomplish things that you never thought you could do. Here's hoping that this year, more than makes up for the last. Today, we'll be talking about the third flight of the new orbiter on the block, Space Shuttle Endeavour. The primary mission was one that will seem pretty familiar to us, the deployment of Tedris f the latest addition to the Tracking and Data Relay Satellite System. Tedris is one of these things that I think is really easy to underestimate. It's so critical to spaceflight operations that it just sort of fades into the background, taken for granted in the same way that people rarely stop to think about how amazing it is that roads exist. So let's not take poor Tedris for granted, and let's do a quick refresher on what the system is and how it works. In the early days of spaceflight, the only way to communicate with an orbiting spacecraft was to build a big ol' antenna on the ground and wait for the spacecraft to fly overhead. This approach gets the job done, but it clearly has some limitations. For one thing, from the perspective of an observer on the ground, a satellite in low Earth orbit will only be visible for a few minutes. After that, you have to wait around an hour and a half for it to go all the way around the world and come back. And depending on the inclination of the orbit and the placement of the ground station, you'll typically only get a couple of consecutive passes like that before a long gap due to the rotation of the Earth. So, you either need to content yourself with fairly short and infrequent contact with your spacecraft, or you need to build a ton of expensive ground stations all over the world. But, since you can only build so many ground stations, and a lot of the surface of the planet is the ocean, you really get the worst of both worlds. A series of short contacts with gaps lasting up to several hours in between. It worked, but it was expensive, annoying, and potentially dangerous, as we saw on Gemini 8, when a thruster on the spacecraft malfunctioned, placing it into a nearly catastrophic spin, all outside of contact with the ground. Tedris solves this problem. By placing a communication satellite in geosynchronous orbit, a satellite in low Earth orbit is able to maintain a connection with it for around half of its orbit, which for LEO works out to 40 or 50 minutes. By adding a second satellite above a different location on the equator, you can ensure that any spacecraft in LEO can stay in contact for around 85% of their orbit. You might be tempted to add a third satellite and extend coverage to 100%, but sticking to two satellites gains you some extra simplicity. Because if you're careful about how you place the two satellites, they can both see the same ground station at the same time. And this is exactly what Tedris did. One satellite in the east, one satellite in the west, and only one expensive ground station, located at White Sands, New Mexico, which can be counted on to have nice clear skies pretty much all the time. In theory, that's all the system needs. But in real-world operations, things get a little more complicated. First, while they ended up lasting a lot longer than planned, each of the early Tedris satellites only had an expected service life of seven years, so it was important to plan on rotating them out of service and replacing them with new satellites. And second, it's important to have a spare satellite already hanging out in orbit. With satellites typically costing hundreds of millions of dollars just to build, let alone launch, it might seem like quite a luxury to have a spare satellite, but it's important to look at the bigger picture. 
1993, Tedris was critical for the operation of over $100 billion worth of space operations. We've got the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, the Upper Atmosphere Research Satellite, the Hubble Space Telescope, the Cosmic Background Explorer, a couple of Landsats, and the vehicle that delivered many of them into orbit, the Space Shuttle. We've also got the upcoming Space Station and Earth Observation System. So, with a replacement Tedris expected to take as much as a year to launch, it was important to have a spare ready to jump in at a moment's notice. Well, maybe not a moment's notice, but certainly less than a year's notice. Of the existing fleet, Tedris 1 was past its service life, so it had been semi-retired. Tedris 2 was destroyed in the Challenger accident, Tedris 3 was only partially functional, and Tedris 4 and 5 were doing great. So, in order to have two fully functional satellites and a fully functional spare ready to jump in, we needed a Tedris 6. And since we don't change the letter to the number until the new satellite is safely in place in GEO, today's payload is Tedris F. Just as a side note, if I understand correctly, the addition of a fully functional Tedris would allow NASA to dedicate Tedris 1 entirely to the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, which had a problem with its tape recorder. By positioning Tedris 1 over Australia and using an existing ground station just for GRO, GRO would be able to just constantly stream its data out to the Tedris constellation and not miss any data, which is pretty handy. If you're getting sick of all this Tedris talk, don't worry. After this, we only have one more launching on the shuttle, Tedris 7. You can hear all about Tedris 8 and the others on some other podcast dedicated to the Atlas II rocket. Also, if there actually is a podcast dedicated to the Atlas II, please let me know. Commanding the flight was John Casper, who I'm sure was glad to be moving to the left seat on only his second mission. We last saw him flying as pilot on STS-36, which deployed something secret, which might have been a reconnaissance satellite named Misty, but we won't know for sure for decades to come. This is Casper's second of four flights. Joining Casper up front was Don McMonagall, who was also flying for a second time. We last saw him flying as a mission specialist on STS-39, where the rendezvous choreography of SPAS-2 surely kept him busy. This is his second of three flights. Moving back, we find mission specialist 1, Mario Runko. We last saw Runko flying on STS-44, which deployed an unclassified DoD communications satellite. This is his second of three flights. Next to Runko was Mission Specialist 2, Greg Harbaugh, who we last saw flying with McMonagall on STS-39. This is his second of four flights. And last but certainly not least, our lone rookie on this flight, Susan Helms. Susan Helms was born on February 26, 1958 in Charlotte, North Carolina, but would tell you that she's from Portland, Oregon. Helms graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy before heading off to the Air Force as an F-16 weapons separation engineer down at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. A couple of years later, she moved to a similar role for the F-15. After that, the Air Force sent her to Stanford University to earn her master's degree before becoming an assistant professor at the Air Force Academy. As she told it in an interview before one of her later missions, she had terrible eyesight, so never qualified as a pilot but was still interested in flying. So when she realized that the Air Force had a role for engineers flying in the back seats of planes, she was eager to sign up. Unlike a lot of people we've talked about on this show, Helms was not, as she put it, born with a burning desire to become an astronaut. But as she continued her flight engineer work, she came to realize that becoming an astronaut was a natural next step on her current trajectory. The way she saw it, the job of a mission specialist was similar to what she was already doing, but even faster and higher. Over the course of her work with the military, she flew in 30 different types of United States and Canadian military aircraft, and in 1990, she got a call asking if she'd like to fly in a different type of vehicle, the Space Shuttle Orbiter. This is her first of four flights. Like most shuttle launches, this flight was postponed a couple of times during the year before liftoff, but it ended up only slipping less than two months from the original date that was scheduled almost two years beforehand. On the big day, the weather cooperated, and other than a seven and a half minute hold to discuss a structural concern, the countdown proceeded smoothly. So it was that on January 13th, 1993, at 8.59 and 30 seconds a.m., Space Shuttle Endeavour lifted off and began NASA's 32nd year of flying humans in space. <laughs> 
Ascent was uneventful, with the now typical direct ascent trajectory eventually placing Endeavour into a 300 km high orbit. An hour and 40 minutes after that, the payload bay doors were opened and the final checkouts on Tedris F could begin. Like all previous Tedris satellites, this one used an inertial upper stage, two small solid motors that would propel it to a geosynchronous orbit. As part of the final checks, connectivity between the payload and the orbiter were checked, and Tedris and its IUS were tilted up out of the payload bay so that it could be verified that the spacecraft could communicate directly with the ground. Once all the checks were passed and Tedris F was verified to be happy and healthy, the support structure was tilted up even more, and only 6 hours and 13 minutes into the mission, Tedris F was released and sailed over the crew cabin as the astronauts peered at it through the overhead windows. A few hours later, it was on its way to GEO, where it would undergo commissioning and be redubbed Tedris 6. As of 2021, it remains in service. As I write this, it's about 36,000 kilometers above the coast of Brazil. With the flight's primary mission complete, we can now turn our attention to the secondary payload in the payload bay, the Diffuse X-Ray Spectrometer, or DXS. X-rays, as we know, are a high-energy form of light. I find it helpful to think of this as just a color that human eyes can't see. Moving up in the electromagnetic spectrum, you've got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, which we can see. But then if we keep going, we get into ultraviolet and X-ray, which we cannot see. We've seen a few payloads studying X-rays from orbit now, looking for X-ray sources like black holes or quasars or other exciting stuff but not all x-rays are made alike. These high-energy x-rays are known as hard x-rays. You're most likely familiar with them as the type used by doctors when you break a bone. But they're not the only x-rays in the sky. If you could see an x-ray, you'd see bright points of hard x-rays from various celestial bodies and a general glow of soft x-rays. These soft x-rays are lower energy than hard x-rays, but still higher energy than ultraviolet. Okay, great, so why do we care about soft x-rays? Because they're emitted by the super-thin gas that permeates the space between the stars. If we could better understand this interstellar medium, we could better understand the structure of galaxies, which lets us better understand where galaxies come from and how they evolve over time. Which is a lot of pretty cool information, all for measuring some x-rays. What's neat about this interstellar plasma is that it's actually over a million degrees Kelvin. That seems totally crazy hot, but you have to remember that when gas is this thin, temperature can be a little counterintuitive. Temperature is really a measure of the random motion of particles inside a substance. In a gas that you're used to dealing with, like air, even air that's just sitting there, particles are constantly whizzing around and bumping into other particles. So any given particle is moving super fast all the time, but it just isn't getting very far. I sort of think of this as like a person in a mosh pit. A person in a mosh pit is constantly being pushed around by the people around them, but they're not necessarily changing their position much relative to the stage. The gas in the space between the stars is so thin that each particle is free to move in completely different directions than the other particles without being bounced around, resulting in them going really fast resulting in a crazy high temperature. But since it's so thin, it also means that it can't transfer very much heat, so a spacecraft flying through it wouldn't just like instantly melt. This is counterintuitive to us, because we're used to living in a world where we're basically swimming in particles. Air, water, the ground, and all of these things transfer heat reasonably well, at least compared to interstellar plasma. It's easy to think of life on Earth as being normal, but it is completely different than conditions in most of the universe. One last note on this. For an example of a crazy hot plasma that's a little bit closer to home, look no further than the fluorescent light bulbs that are likely somewhere in your house right now. The plasma inside the bulb reaches tens of thousands of degrees, but since it's so thin and there's so few particles in there, there isn't really all that much energy, so you can still touch the bulb without just bursting into flames. Plasma is weird. The DXS instrument itself was pretty unobtrusive. Split into two pieces, if they weren't pointed out to you in a photo of the payload bay, it's likely that you wouldn't even notice them, 
just a couple of boxes wrapped in white fabric mounted to either side of the payload bay. Along with the boxes was a curved element, which contained thin segments of a special crystal. Soft x-rays would enter the curved element, bounce off of the crystal, and then be directed to some film at the bottom of the instrument. The trick here is that by carefully redirecting the x-rays with the curve and the crystal, it could be sorted by energy level. This energy level sorting is called spectroscopy, hence the name diffuse x-ray spectrometer. By breaking the x-rays down into their various energy levels, scientists could really dig in and learn all about the temperature and composition of this interstellar plasma, something that could never be done on Earth since the atmosphere would absorb the x-rays. In fact, the Earth's atmosphere is not the only thing that absorbed these soft x-rays. The interstellar medium that they were studying would also absorb them, which meant that all of the observed x-rays were from a maximum of only a few hundred light years away which in astronomy terms is practically Earth's backyard. The diffuse X-ray spectrometer was a pretty interesting experiment, but sort of boring from the crew point of view. They turned it on at the start of the mission, and they turned it off near the end of the mission. It passively collected data, and the folks at the Goddard Space Flight Center kept an eye on it. Something that was a whole lot more exciting for the crew was the flight's next objective, a good old-fashioned spacewalk. With the space station looming closer and closer on the horizon, folks on the ground had worked out how it would have to be assembled and realized that astronauts were going to have to spend a little time outside. Actually, a lot of time outside. Even with careful design and extensive use of the shuttle's robotic arm, building the space station was going to take dozens and dozens of EVAs. Which is great, except you may have noticed that we actually haven't been doing a ton of EVAs lately. Planning a spacewalk takes a lot of time and resources, and as we saw on Endeavour's first flight, which saw three astronauts outside wrestling with Intel sat, they don't always go as planned. Plus, they're dangerous. Even with all the engineering and all the planning, you're still sending a person out into the void inside a tiny, flexible spaceship. There's a lot that can go wrong. So EVAs weren't something that you would just do for funsies. But, as a result of this, there wasn't actually all that much EVA experience in the astronaut corps. According to Ben Evans' book, Partnership in Space, at this point in the program, less than 10% of the active astronauts had any EVA experience. And that's just the astronauts. Who knows how many trainers, technicians, and other ground personnel could use more experience with extravehicular activity. To help fix this problem, with only about two months to go before liftoff, STS-54 suddenly gained an EVA. The objective? Well, basically to do an EVA. <laughs> what? Let's just get going and I'll explain on the way. On flight day four, Greg Harbaugh and Mario Runko suited up, stuffed themselves into the airlock, and opened the door to head outside. Susan Helms would stay on the flight deck, looking out the aft windows and assisting the EVA crew. Don't feel too bad, though. Helms will get her own EVA a little bit down the road, and will set a record for longest spacewalk that still stands to this day. Once they got outside, Harbaugh and Runko, from what I can tell, basically just puttered around. They practiced moving around the payload bay, handling tools, and moving stuff around. The basic stuff that would be critical for building the space station, or servicing satellites, or whatever. Tedris F was gone, but they were able to use the support equipment for its upper stage to practice some contingency techniques. If the motor that tilted the IUS up failed, the crew was equipped to go out and manually crank it to the correct angle. So, even though there was nothing on it, they moved the support platform up and down using their specialized tools. One of the goals today was to practice moving heavy things around the payload bay. But since this EVA was added so late, there wasn't anything heavy to move around. So, somewhat hilariously, the two crewmates just took turns carrying each other around, with one playing the role of cargo, and the other trying to load them into the airlock. When I apply to be an astronaut, I'm going to put that on my resume as an applicable skill. Has mass. See STS-54 EVA. While outside, Mario Runko had a pretty remarkable moment, which he described in an interview with the Smithsonian. While he was waiting for Greg Harbaugh to finish something, he found himself with a little bit of that most precious resource in space, free time. At the time, Runko's feet were locked into a platform, as we've seen on numerous earlier EVAs. 
This left his hands free to use tools, and gave him a little bit of leverage so that he wouldn't be pushed back from whatever he was working on. With his newfound spare moment, he did something that he was used to doing during underwater training, and bent at the knees, bending backwards in a motion similar to doing the limbo. In space, with no weight to support, this cantilevered position is apparently pretty relaxing. But when Runko popped back up, he forgot another lesson of STS-49. When you train underwater, the water slows things down. But when you're actually in space, there is no water! There's nothing to slow you down. So Runko popped up and just went rocketing forward so fast that part of him was worried that he'd just wrench himself right off the restraint and go tumbling off into space. Runko didn't go tumbling off, but he did find himself suddenly thrust up against a view where there was no Earth and no orbiter, just staring off into the infinite void. There were a couple of stars, but as he describes it, there was just an infinite, dizzying blackness. This sight was so foreign to the human experience that his brain interpreted some stars as being closer and some being further away, with each star's apparent distance changing whenever he blinked. He compared this sensation of tumbling into the stars as something straight out of the film 2001. In the end, during this brief moment, Runko was treated to an incredible view that few humans, even astronauts, have experienced, and it made him feel more connected to the universe, giving him what he called a sense of the divine. So, it was maybe with that sense of the divine that he made a statement that I think we can all get behind. Thank God for tethers. After around four and a half hours outside, Harbaugh and Runko climbed back in and closed the airlock hatch. Nothing tangible had really been accomplished, but the EVA planners and trainers, suit technicians, mission controllers, the crew, and countless other people involved in the flight all gained four and a half more hours of EVA experience. And when you're going to build a space station the size of a football field, every little bit counts. Unfortunately, none of the crew members from this flight met up with NASA's oral history team, so I don't have any goofy anecdotes for you this time. But I can tell you that Susan Helms, who had played piano since she was a kid, carried a miniature keyboard with her on this flight and played the Air Force Anthem while flying at 17,500 miles per hour. I guess she must have been a pretty decent piano player, because shortly after being selected as an astronaut, she was recruited into the all-astronaut band Max Q. If that phrase sounds familiar, it's the point of a launch where the vehicle experiences maximum dynamic pressure. The air pushes back on the vehicle at maximum strength. And what is sound, if not dynamic pressure? There was the usual slew of smaller mid-deck experiments, including lighting stuff on fire, carefully, to study its behavior in microgravity, growing some plants to see how their DNA was affected, and confusing some rats. But the flight was over before you knew it. On flight day six, the crew suited up, closed the payload bay doors, strapped into their seats, and fired the Ohms engines for 153 seconds, beginning the long fall back to Earth. Entry proceeded with no surprises, and Endeavour touched down at the shuttle landing facility at the Kennedy Space Center, rolling to a stop, and capping off a mission lasting 5 days, 23 hours, 38 minutes, and 19 seconds. I like this flight because I think it's precisely the type of flight that would normally be skipped in a history of the space shuttle. Just like the roads, it's easy to take for granted, but it contributed to the critical infrastructure that made everything else possible. Life in space without Tedris is almost unthinkable at this point, and every scrap of experience that NASA could get with people outside the spacecraft would be critical for the next 15 years of activity in low Earth orbit. And thanks to standardization efforts like Goddard's Hitchhiker program, even this relatively simple mission was able to contribute valuable data and enhance our understanding of how the galaxies themselves were formed. So, I think that we should take a moment and appreciate STS-54, and be glad that we have roads. Next time, we're not done trying to reveal the universe's secrets. Discovery is back on the launch pad with a cargo bay full of instruments, another free flyer to chase down, and the return of ham radio in space. Let's call some cosmonauts. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass.